Welcome to the third webinar in the Psychedelics and Mental Health series hosted by the Center for the Neuroscience of Psychedelics at Mass General Hospital. Today's program features Dr. Stephen Haggerty, Scientific Director of Chemical Neuro Neurobiology for the Center. Dr. Haggerty is the Stuart and Suzanne Steele MGH Research Scholar with appointments at Harvard Medical School, the Broad Institute, and MIT. He'll take us on a deep dive into the power of MGH's cutting edge chemical neurobiology and how he plans to bring those technologies to bear on a library of Harvard's unique collection of psychoactive plants. This work will help to better understand the ways that novel psychedelic compounds can facilitate lasting changes in mental health, also potentially neurodegenerative diseases, including Parkinson's and ALS, and possibly Alzheimer's, as well as overall well-being. Dr. Haggerty's presentation links the pioneering work from the history of psychedelics with state-of-the-art science and technology to help define the future of psychedelics and brain health. For those who are new to the series, I suggest you also listen to the earlier salon recordings for an overview, as well as a better understanding of the amazing neuroimaging capabilities at MGH. Today, you'll get a behind the scenes look at one of the key pillars of the center being brought to life at MGH, Harvard Medical School's primary teaching hospital and the hub of the Boston biomedical ecosystem. I'm Dick Simon, chair of the center's advisory council. I spent all of my time doing what I can to advance psychedelic therapies for treating a wide range of mental health issues. I'm motivated both by the astounding data supporting the efficacy of psychedelic therapy and from having experienced the seemingly intractable nature of mental health issues in my own family. I'm excited about this center with its unparalleled human and technological resources, as well as its integrative approach of psychiatry, cognitive neuroscience, neuroimaging, and chemical neurobiology, the subject of today's salon. As a reminder, at any point, you can type questions at the Q&A button, and we'll address them during the question and answer. Now I'm happy to introduce my good friend, Dr. Gerald Rosenbaum, founding director of the MGH Center for the Neuroscience of Psychedelics. Dr. Rosenbaum is psychiatrist and chief emeritus for MGH's psychiatry department which he stewarded as the top-ranked psychiatry department in the United States for 20 years and a professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. He brings 47 years experience as one of the preeminent psychiatrists and psychopharmacology experts in the world. Jerry. I, I want to uh, uh, thank Dick for his uh, being an extraordinary patron and advocate. Uh, for the field and for our center. And in a moment, it's going to be my uh, distinct pleasure to uh, introduce my uh, extraordinary colleague, uh, Steve Haggerty, who is the scientific director for neurobiology of the Center for the Neuroscience of Psychedelics. Uh, at MGH, we were inspired by the idea that the class of agents known as psychedelics can offer a window on how to move the brain to change in a way that can address many of the most anguishing forms of human suffering. Um, so we are mobilizing the extraordinary resources of the Mass General Research Institute and, the Ma and Mass General Neuroscience at the largest hospital-based biomedical uh, resource in the US with well north of a billion dollars of annual funded science to go through that window on the brain that these molecules can open. And once inside, by understanding the neuroscience of these effects, we will dramatically advance the efficacy and precision of therapeutics for brain disease. As many of you have heard before, the center has multiple dimensions through which it will take on this challenge. And today's webinar will focus on one aspect of the work of, of our director of neurobiology, Steve Haggerty, who will address the topic of ethnobotany and psychedelic discovery. Again, we uh, will take a number of questions. We'll leave time at the end for questions. So please take note of the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens. And now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, my colleague and friend, Steve Haggerty. I'm just delighted to uh, be here this afternoon and have the chance to speak to you all about the work um, as Dr. Rosenbaum just introduced to you 
um, that we're engaged in uh, within the Center for the Neuroscience um, of Psychedelics. This is an area, I think, of long-standing interest um, for myself in terms of the potential contributions that the field of chemical neurobiology can play uh, in this really exciting um, area of translational neuroscience and therapeutic um, applications. When thinking about how we can bring translational neuroscience uh, into the center, we conceived of a vision here in which we would be able to build a collaborative network of research investigators who are focused on advancing our fundamental knowledge of the molecular, cellular, and network level mechanisms of neuroplasticity that, as Jerry just described to you, psychedelics can modulate. Our goal here is really to advance then the ability to use precision medicine concepts in the context of psychedelic therapy, which we might summarize as considering the right drug for the right patient um, at the right time. Now, before I get into the science of what I wanna share with you today, I want each of you to just think for a moment of whether you yourself have consumed a psychoactive plant today. This exercise is usually a little more fun in person to see he or she that will raise their hand bravely um, to share with us their experience. So think for a moment if you did. And I'll begin answering myself that question and admitting that this morning, in fact, this afternoon as well, I consumed some coffee, an extract then from a bean of a plant known as coffee arabaca. Those of you joining us uh, on the webinar here from the United Kingdom a little later in the afternoon, or perhaps you're in India or China, um, we might have consumed a black tea then, Camellia sinensis, um, then, a widely known and widely consumed um, psychoactive plant. Those of you that are joining us perhaps from South America in the countries of Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay might have consumed Alexis paraguensis, commonly known um, as Yerba uh, Mate. And the notion here that I'm trying to get across of is the fact that actually the use of psychoactive plants in modern society um, is very widespread. And certain plants, as the ones I just shared with you, um, we all take for granted have beneficial effects, or at least um, I do, I'm mean, grateful for on, on any given day. Now, within those three plants that I just described to you, there are a number of small molecules, including this methylxanthine member, caffeine, that we recognize then as a stimulant of the nervous system. And we understand aspects of how that molecule works through um, engagement with a receptor called the adenosine receptor. And this is a class or member of a larger class of very interesting um, small molecules then, of alkaloids then. Now, the class of molecules that we're um, so excited about here in the context um, of the Center for Neuroscience of Psychedelics, of course, are a special class of psychoactive um, agents then, that is the name psychedelics tries to capture in so-called mind manifesting. There are molecules then with profound effects on perception, thought, and mood, uh, and are showing incredible promise then um, clinically. These molecules, of course, have been used by humans for millennia, as long as there's recorded uh, record. The special scientific challenge, though, as was introduced to you on the webinar um, last um, session, particularly from the work then of Bruce Rosen and colleagues using neuroimaging, is the notion that psychedelics can modulate aspects of neuroplasticity at a wide range of scales not only changing, for example, overall connectivity patterns of neurons within the nervous system, um, but also aspects of their activity and down to the level of function of individual neurons. And as this beautiful review by Robin Carhart Harris and colleagues summarizes, the challenge for the field um, is to understand how is it that the engagement of a particular receptor by a psychedelic leads to that psychedelic experience then and potentially catalyzes therapeutic benefit. A specific example of this of great interest might be this small molecule, um, so psilocybin, derived then initially from a fungus. And our concept here of using plants really extends then to our world um, of fungi uh, and microbes as well for this. These molecules provide incredible tools then to gain insight into the mechanisms of brain function that if harnessed correctly, we think have incredible therapeutic um, promise. What I want you all then to imagine then is the future. This isn't what exists right now, but it's the future we'd like to work towards building. And let's consider then a 
um, hypothetical patient here, we'll call her Liz, that comes into the Mass General Hospital Department of Psychiatry to receive care. Liz might be suffering, as is common, from depression or anxiety or another psychiatric disorder. Working with the clinicians at MGH then to collect a family history and understand aspects then um, of Liz's unique case may lead then to a um, desire to explore a psychedelic um, therapeutic. What we'd like to envision then is how the research that you heard about last um, webinar, namely the advanced neuroimaging, might provide insight then uh, at the level of particular circuits that might be dysfunctional uh, in Liz that might benefit then from a psychedelic therapy. Such research might also help us understand that individual for a diagnosis of what they might um, benefit from. But additional areas of translational research that we want to bring into the center then will involve the incorporation of genome sequencing methods to understand if there are particular genetic risk factors that might be predisposing someone to a psychiatric disease. But the technology that I'm most passionate about and excited to tell you more here um, that we think can have a transformative effect on our understanding of how psychedelics function and understanding their mechanism in a very deep level is one involving cellular reprogramming that lets us derive from a particular patient then through, for example, a skin biopsy, a sample that can be reprogrammed into a cell, a so-called induced pluripotent stem cell that can be differentiated into neurons. This remarkably then allows us to study an individual patient's pharmacology in the lab, in the dish, opening up this incredible opportunity to perform ex vivo tests of psychedelic agents. And in doing so, we hope this research then will be able to feed back and impact ultimately um, patient care. Now, the ability to create an induced pluripotent stem cell has existed for about a decade through the Nobel Prize winning research of Yamanaka and colleagues and many others in the field that have really enabled this amazing ability to take a skin sample or it could be a blood sample or another sample from a patient and reprogramming it into this induced pluripotent stem cell. What's shown here is a colony of thousands of iPS cells growing on a feeder layer of cells the cells like to be close to each other and interact with each other. But what's amazing about these cells is what we can do and that is differentiate them into pretty much any cell type in the human body. For us, what's exciting then is this ability to grow human neural networks in the lab and do so in miniaturized formats that's amenable then to our efforts to screen and identify psychoactive molecules. What's depicted on this slide is one particular approach that we use in the lab, one that has facilitated our research by allowing us to develop these assays on a higher throughput um, scale. And remarkably, in a two week time period, we can go from these proliferating progenitor cells into these cells as depicted on the right that begin to form neural networks and form synapses as depicted with the individual arrows. We're able then to use robotic microscopy, and high resolution and high content imaging methodology to extract quantitative information then about, for example, the length of the axons and dendrites and the number of synapses. This technology then enables us to test an individual patient's neurons then in their response to psychedelic agents. What's even more remarkable though, is we're not constrained to running these assays in a two dimensional world. Technology involving so-called organoid formation is letting us study many brains or three-dimensional organizations of these neurons that begin to mimic, although not fully recapitulate, the complexity of the human brain. If we were to take a high-resolution microscope and look at this little floating mini brain as is captured here in the Petri dish, we'd be able to detect then the different layers of cell types that are present and similar to those uh, in the human cortex. This allows us then to study particular cell types that the neuroimaging and other approaches have told us are important for the response to psychedelic agents. In particular, the ability to create these so-called layer five specific excitatory cortical neurons then, a cell type that expresses particularly the 5-HT2A receptor is one that's we think really exciting then for probing the activity of psychedelic uh, agents. But more generally, we can study other aspects of neuroplasticity that have been implicated in response to psychedelics and may be critical for their long-term persistent effects. 
And that includes then activities at the level of neurogenesis, so the formation of new neurons, the alterations in axon dendrite structure that may contribute then to connectivity, and ultimately the formation and maintenance of synapses. These are the aspects of neuroplasticity that have never been able to be probed in a human context before, and the use then of stem cell and reprogramming technology uh, allows us to perform these uh, ex vivo scans. What we envision then is the application of these technologies, not just to Liz, but Liz is one member of a larger family or cohort of individuals that might um, be have studied and enrolled in the clinical trials. We want to deeply characterize this patient cohort using the advanced neuroimaging methods that Bruce Rosen and colleagues spoke about and their um, work then by our clinicians to understand the individual um, cases. Our ability to derive from these um, patients a patient-specific stem cell then and characterize them deeply at the level of their genome, the transcriptome, the genes that might be turned on, their proteome, all of the proteins that might be expressed and ultimately physiology will give us a deep understanding at an individual um, patient level. What we'd like to understand is the fact that there may be some responders in this population that respond to the psychedelic agent very well but also some non-responders that um, don't show the desired therapeutic effect or in some cases an adverse response. And we think that if we can derive then correlates in the lab that allow us to make these predictions will improve ultimately patient care um, by helping our clinical colleagues choose the right drug for the right patient uh, at the right time. Now, this is something we're really excited about as a technology and approach then for studying existing psychedelic agents. Um, but we're also interested and excited to advance towards the development of what we consider next generation psychedelic agents. These would be agents that have an improved property and efficacy, the ability then ultimately to provide therapeutic benefit and perhaps reduced side effects and increased um, tolerability. And the scientific question comes, where can we go about finding such molecules? And one approach, of course, is to take the existing ones and to use chemistry to derivatize them and develop new analogs. But as was introduced to you, we're inspired here to take um, an understanding or build on the understanding that comes from really the foundation of the psychedelic field. That is work by ethnobotanists such as Richard Evan Schultes, a very influential Harvard professor and educator who worked very closely with a number of indigenous people's populations in a variety of countries to really create an understanding from an ethnobotany perspective of many of the psychedelic agents that are currently of clinical interest. And Dr. Schultes then predicted here that the medicines of the future will actually come from our understanding then of the forest uh, itself and use then um, of indigenous people's knowledge. Um, those of you that know Dr. Schultes know that he really inspired a generation of investigators to develop the field of ethnobotany. He himself is a legendary character that um, performed field work in the Amazon for over a decade, taking a leave of absence, if you will, from Harvard. Um, in his travels then, he collected over 24,000 different plants, described more than 300 new species, and wrote over 500 papers. For those of you that want to learn more about Schulte's pioneering work, I'd reference you here to the Amazon team uh, website here, which describes his journeys um, in great detail and some of the amazing findings of his research. Schulte's work then um, inspires us so through the principle of um, collaboration and inspiration and of interdisciplinary activity. It was this little book that Schultes, as a pre-med student at Harvard, um, first read, a book written by a psychiatrist written about mescaline, that inspired Schultes then to take the career path away from medical school, but into the field of ethnobotany. By the time Schultes graduated from Harvard with a master's degree and his PhD, he contributed then fundamental insights then uh, into what we now recognize as the sacred cacti, such as peyote, Tionotocotl, the source of psilocybin, and Ololiqui, then the source of morning glories, really reflecting then um, three of the major classes of psychedelic agents currently uh, of interest. And working with colleagues then, such as Dr. Um, Albert Hoffman, 
Schulte um, was able to write these um, descriptions then that have now become definitive and inspirational guides towards the field of um, psychoactive um, plants. Uh, and in particular, this long-standing collaboration then between chemistry, biology, uh, and psychiatrists have created the foundation that we're interested in building upon. When one takes a deeper look through the amazing writings of Schultes and others in the field, we see very elegant descriptions then of plants that at the time were very poorly understood, but of course now um, are of great interest um, medicinally. Uh, Schulte's own um, uh, the, um, sort of inspiration, the botanist Richard Spruce, first described a series of plants, Banisteropsis capi then, the source of the harmine class of alkaloids, also a plant that's a member of that coffee family um, that we described at the beginning. Schultes then not only described these more commonly used um, psychedelic agents, but also in his writings a variety of less well stu uh, studied but really exciting plants such as Tetrapteris, Mathisica, for which his description of this is still true, that nothing is really known about it chemically, um, but has very similar effects to other types of ayahuasca that are um, more widespread and used. These then, and his writings, are inspirations for us to more deeply understand scientifically the nature of the psychoactive agents in each one of these plants. The fact is that we understand very little um, of many of these, and I've picked here three examples from Schulte's writings then that are of great interest to us. Echorus americanus, or sweet flag, an agent that has medicinal and stimulant properties with possible psychedelic activities, is of interest because it's present here in North America, including in Massachusetts, although my trips on the weekends to local swamps and wet areas have not identified this plant, uh, at least here in Boston. Another great example of a poorly understood but widespread genus of plants with potential psychoactive components here are Calia zacatini here, so-called dream herbs, that have been described then to have the ability to clarify senses, enable spirit communications, and lucid dreaming. Really a really exciting genus of plants then um, that requires further investigation. And beyond the more classical stimulants or aspects then of sort of um, psychedelic hallucinogens, um, this um, plant here, such as Scalidium tortsum, a plant then from South Africa that the work of Nigel Gerke and colleagues then have characterized as having potential mood enhancing, memory enhancing, and ability to combat, combat fatigue, pain, and anxiety, is another example of a really exciting plant requiring further uh, investigation. But what's most amazing about, I think, Schultes as an investigator and professor at Harvard is he continued to have a, a prolific uh, um, effect on the field uh, even after his uh, retirement. And one of the last scientific papers that he wrote, 78 years old then, um, again, seven years after his retirement from Harvard, summarizes the potential benefits for research then for neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's and motor neuron diseases. Then. And what Schulte's taking all of his research for over the 50 years throughout um, Northern Amazon and other areas summarized was of the 1500 plants that are used for some medicinal purpose or as a potential poison. There were 25 different plants which we, he suggested would be useful to study in the context of diseases of the elderly. One such example is this beautiful plant, Taber Montana herophilia, that is used by the indigenous people of Brazil then that is consumed as a tea for roughly a two week time period for, and is used then for individuals who are old and slow and forgetful. These are really exciting leads then to think about um, the potential um, psychoactive agents uh, in these plants. What we want to do on the basis of this knowledge then is to really begin studying them, taking advantage of some of the advanced technology that just didn't exist at the time um, Schultes and others were doing their foundational work. So based on their writings then here, we want to systematically assess some of the plants that would really benefit um, from further study, creating a particular so-called neuronatural library. This will involve collaborations with traditional knowledge keepers, ethnobotanists, chemists, and psychiatrists and neurologists carrying on that tradition of interdisciplinary collaboration uh, that Schultes um, supported. We want to create then unique fractionations and extracts from um, each one of these plants, supplementing our library then 
with purified compounds and of course known psychedelic agents that are of interest based on ongoing clinical studies. We want to use that collection then in combination with those patient-derived stem cell models that I told you about to generate unique molecular and cellular signatures in our neurons and so-called mini brains. Again, for this work to go on, it's going to require close collaboration across multiple different uh, areas of investigation, work with our psychiatry colleagues to point to the kinds of assays and molecules that would be most interesting to identify, uh, work with our neuroimagers to be able to annotate the patient models as ones which might respond to a particular class of agents and those interested uh, in developing new medicines. What I want you to envision, though, is again the future here. Um, taking advantage of some of the learnings that we already know in the psychedelic field, particularly an example here that comes from study of ayahuasca or yahe. The notion here that this medicine is composed really of multiple different plants, Banisteropsis capi, that plant genus that uh, Schultes and Spruce um, perform some of the initial characterization of, that's often taken in combination with another plant such as Psychotroia veritis then, a source of dimethyltryptamine. The com combination of these two classes of molecules then represents this important notion of synergy, or in other words, an entourage effect through the combination of multiple molecules. What we'd like to do experimentally then is to really systematize this process of discovering molecules that can enhance uh, each other's activity, a so-called systems neuropharmacology, which the systematic study then of the combination of these agents allows us to create a network where each molecule is represented by a node and we connect them together with an edge that forms our overall understanding of psychedelic neural networks. Creating this map, creating this network then with the kinds of assays that we can now perform using patient-derived stem cell models, uh, we think will provide a new foundation for the field of psychedelic medicine. Um, to come back to where I started with here, to bring this uh, again together, um, success uh, in this activity is something that requires the unique type of interdisciplinary collaborative environment, the Center for Neuroscience of Psychedelics that we uh, are building here at Mass General. That's because we need to work closely with our colleagues then in psychiatry to create uh, models then from our patients that let us study their ex vivo response. We need to deeply annotate them with um, neuroimaging methods and genetic approaches. And we think if we can successfully pull these pieces of translational research together, we can ultimately create this field of precision psychedelic medicine. And I think this is a really exciting endeavor um, for a variety of individuals to contribute to. I want to end, though, um, with a quote, which is really a question uh, that Richard Evan Schultes and Albert Hoffman um, posed at the beginning of the book that really influenced my interest uh, in this area nearly two decades ago. And that was um, Schultes and Hoffman asked, if we were able to perform a thorough understanding of the use of chemicals and understanding of the use and the chemical composition of psychedelics, would this not lead to the discovery of new pharmaceutical tools for psychiatric treatment or experimentation? And of course, we think the answer to this question uh, is yes, and that carrying on the legacy here of Schultes, Hoffman, and others in the field of ethnobotany and ethnopharmacology um, positions us then um, to be able to have this impact ultimately on the treatment uh, of patients. And with that, I'm happy to um, take some questions here from the audience. And I thank you again for spending um, a portion of your time this afternoon uh, and uh, going on this uh, exciting journey uh, with us. I'll just acknowledge then the fantastic colleagues and I get to work with here at Mass General Hospital, not only within my lab, but an extended network of collaborators then within Harvard Medical School uh, and beyond. Um, the inspiration for our research then comes from members of the community of ethnobotanists, ethnomycologists, ethnopharmacologists, and ultimately then traditional knowledge keepers and healers that inspire us um, to look in this direction. So with that, um, thank you very much for listening this afternoon. Hey, that's, uh, that's really fun. And uh, the, uh, the promise of this research is really exceptional. Uh, a number of questions, um, and uh, I, I hope we'll have time to get to them all. Uh, again, for those who have more questions, uh, use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, first question is that um, there, there's been, you know, hundreds of years of, of uh, 
psychedelic use or, or uh, psychoactive plant use. Um, and uh, some of those are now uh, being studied as therapeutics and are, are widely used. Uh, how did they achieve ascendancy uh, over uh, the hundreds of other options, some of which you referred to? Was this chance? Was it natural selection? And I guess the, the implicit uh, part of this question, is there a reason to believe um, we can do better, be more precise or innovate by exploring all these other options that have not been uh, uh, used as widely? Yeah, um, Jerry, that's an excellent question here of why are we so excited about um, a small number of plants right now? And I think arguably that's because um, of the focus um, on these and what's been demonstrated as their potential therapeutic promise. So when we think about so-called magic mushrooms or um, those species of psilocybe that produces psilocybin and related uh, agents in it, um, I think one of the reasons those have been more widespread has been, uh, again, the perhaps ease of culturing and growing um, mushrooms culturally um, across the area. These are agents then that didn't require synthetic chemistry in the early days to produce. Although, of course, now understanding what the psychoactive principle is, synthetic chemistry can be used to produce those uh, agents in a purified and standardized way. The same is true, I think, when we look at components then of ayahuasca, such as the dimethyltryptamine, which again is being explored then potential therapeutic applications. So there's this interplay, I think, between understanding the plant, its use, um, chemistry to elucidate the active principles. And in some ways, the current research then is focused on these examples then of the major classes that Schulte's first described then of um, aspects of phenylethamines, um, the uh, ergot alkaloid class, uh, and the tri tryptamines. And so the question is, um, are there others out there um, that perhaps have benefit, um, that have been overlooked? And if you read closely some of Schulte's writings, he would say, yes, there are a number of um, plants that have just for either historical reasons been less well characterized um, because they may be localized in a unique geography, a unique culture, but have the potential then to have just as much benefit then uh, when applied in a therapeutic context. And so I think that's the excitement in the field is the examples we have right now are a roadmap, um, but can we improve on them? Can we make them more well tolerated? Can we reduce the side effect profiles uh, in some cases? And can we make um, a greater percentage of the population respond to them? Uh, and I think the answer to that is yes. Can you extend that roadmap a little bit in the, uh, uh, the, uh, on the journey beyond your lab and how what you're doing can eventually become therapeutics? Can you say more about what has to happen next after you curate this incredible library of opportunity? Yeah, so I think one of the exciting aspects of using a plant that has already been used by humans is that we understand something about the safety and toxicology of them. Not everything, but in many cases, we're able to learn that a plant, for example, um, isn't going to produce an addictive substance or produce one which is necessarily ultimately toxic to the body. And so that's a real um, step forward in the therapeutic discovery um, process. But it requires then um, close collaboration and interaction then with um, a chemist, for example, that might be interested in synthesizing a subset or a series of molecules from that and exploring then ultimately what we learn about the targets of those molecules. And so an example might be that most of our psychedelic agents that we are of current clinical interest are targeting the 5-HT2A receptor. So imagine that we uncover and discover a different receptor, a different target then that perhaps has some unique advantages therapeutically. I think there are already clues when we look at plants like Scalidium and others that of course are not targeting the 5-HT2A receptor, but have these other effects then that we wouldn't characterize as traditionally hallucinogenic, but are clearly important for uh, impacting neuroplasticity. And I think it's kind of expanding the definition of psychedelic to incorporate new mechanisms and new activities that's important there. And that may lead to the recognition that there's an existing natural product that um, can be utilized, but it might be that identification of a target then that allows us to engage in a more traditional drug discovery process then um, as the pharmaceutical industry would to optimize synthetic compounds for them. 
I'm a little agnostic about both and I think approaches and I think though um, the inspiration of a natural product though keeps us um, you know, focused on exciting molecules. Now I was going to ask you a question about you know, what your favorite uh, plant is but you just referred to it so not, and I think I know the answer but maybe others would be interested to know. Yeah, you know, I'm this um, really excited by this plant, Scalidium tortsum, that Nigel Gurkey from South Africa has characterized in great detail and written about um, with its potential effects then for aspects of um, mood, well-being, um, anxiety, and overall um, sort of uh, energy. And this is an interesting example because it's right now it's not a scheduled substance. It's not something that is controlled then in the same way that a um, psilocybin or DMT or other agents are, and is really targeting, I think, a really critical area of investigation of thinking about agents then to help with uh, disorders such as treatment-resistant um, depression uh, and anxiety. And it's just um, following the um, descriptions then of this plant and thinking about some of the mechanisms, and there are a few alkaloids that are known within this plant that may be mediating these activities. And those targets and mechanisms then are really exciting to try to understand, can we develop on the basis of that assays using our human neurons um, that report on their activity. And again, this is interesting where a plant, of course, is already consumed and used by people, but we just don't understand the neurobiology and neuroscience of it yet. Right. By going backwards, then we can begin to fill in um, those pictures. But I have a long list of um, plants that, again, are really exciting about. And if you were to ever open... Um, I think you pick a favorite. <laughs> you know, here's a very, very important question. I'll, I, I'll read it. Uh, it says, how does the center intend to create a reciprocally beneficial relationship with indigenous groups to whom we are indebted for carrying the knowledge of these psychoactive plants over the centuries? Critical question is the work may result in patenting and profiting off related molecules. Yeah, that's an excellent question. You know, in this area, we have to be mindful of the importance of following some of the conventions, such as the United Nations Convention on Biodiversity, that um, requires us to consider the kind of equivalent notion of an informed consent and our ability then to uh, consider um, access to the resources that are created from such a product. Um, an investigation. And I think the answer to that question is to really work closely with those in the um, area which are traditional knowledge keepers and elevate their voices through understanding um, it is their knowledge that is inspiring us and working towards us, uh, work, or inspiring us in the directions that we want to go. And I, I think there are ways and examples then of how to do that, to think about it proactively, to provide um, a sharing of any possible um, resources that are created, whether they be financial or access to the medicine, then it may not um, be present then. And I think it's an important one that also, a question that also touches on aspects of conservation, um, recognizing that some of these plants, particularly within the Amazon, um, are right now um, very, very much um, under um, stress from uh, destruction of the environment. And one of the, I think, greatest legacies of Schultes and colleagues then was really to point towards the early value of protecting these areas uh, and protecting this knowledge then of indigenous cultures and people. So um, the short answer is we'd love to work with people that want to help us do that correctly and effectively then um, towards new, new, new areas. There have been a number of questions that have touched on something you, you referred to in passing, uh, which is the possibility of, uh, of uh, the knowledge derived from exploring uh, uh, these uh, the, the uh, novel uh, uh, molecules derived from these plants for non-psychiatric conditions. There was a question about, you know, can you imagine uh, 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 a therapeutic that might help people with uh, coma or other or neurodegenerative diseases or Alzheimer's. Um, how how might you can imagine that that uh, um, uh, outcome? Yeah, so you know, again, uh, one of the exciting aspects about uh, Schulte's writings, in particular, were the description then of these twenty five plants then that he suggested would be of great value for studying in the context of what we would consider. Um, uh, to be a, a, an Alzheimer's disease type um, dementia. And remarkably, since that publication, as far as I can tell, there's been very little investigation of many of those plants. 
But if we actually take a step back, um, the um, use of psychoactive plants has already played an important role in development of treatments for Alzheimer's disease. And the reason we have acetylcholinesterase inhibitors such as galanthamine um, comes from our knowledge then of particular um, plants that have the ability to inhibit acetylcholinesterases. And so that's one mechanism. That's not a disease modifying mechanism for treatment of dementia, but is an agent that can provide benefit um, to patients. And so um, using the kinds of patient derived stem cell models that we've already generated in the lab from patients with a variety of neurodegenerative diseases, so tauopathies uh, and uh, dementia, um, we can create models then that really ask model aspect of the disease and use those to screen for new agents. And um, I'm amazed going through and reading, you know, of those 1500 plants that Schultes and colleagues described, the diversity of potential um, applications beyond maybe infectious diseases and areas, but skeletal muscular disorders, paralysis, a whole range of agents. And um, again, as they are often referred to, very little characterization to none has been done on the chemical um, components. And so if we believe, I think, in the successes of discovery of um, agents like psilocybin, we should believe then in the potential then for moving forward with characterization of these agents. Uh, one quick question was, can you repeat the name of that plant that we referred to as your favorite? And that was the Scalidium torturosa, right? Is that? Yeah, it may but not be saying. We, we don't really want to say it's your favorite because you love all your children equally. I love many of them because I'm fascinated by them. I'm fascinated by the potential and the history of each one of them. And I'll give you another um, example of one that I think is really interesting. And that is, we all understand that Ayahuasca is composed of multiple plants, an admixture then to the initial um, Banisteropsis capi, the source then of the monoamine oxidase inhibitor. But there are also descriptions of other agents added, for example, to um, facilitate after the psychedelic experience, a memory of that activity. So perhaps what we would put in maybe psychiatry terms, helping with the integration of that therapeutic event is if someone is able to access that memory later then um, in their life. And such a plant then um, has already been described uh, in um, the Amazon as being added to um, ayahuasca mixtures. And so I think as we understand what is it that would actually have the most benefit for patients, um, is it that kind of agent that has the ability then to prolong the experience and potential therapeutic benefit um, for a patient, or perhaps it's the opposite. Perhaps it's a fast acting agent um, that has really an impact for only maybe minutes that facilitates the process then of um, um, access to a broader set of patients in a clinical setting. And so I think, again, answering those questions requires this close collaboration with our clinical colleagues um, to define. But uh, again, I, I'm really amazed each time I sit down each evening and look through um, some of the writings in the field, not just of plants, but also our fungal friends then. Um, I think there's some amazing starting points for um, discovery here. Your, your last answer sort of uh, begs another question, which is, you know, medicine for many diseases, whether it's cancer or hypertension or even psychopharmacology, we often, to get the best result, have to combine agents uh, that have similar or sometimes over, overlapping and sometimes different mechanisms. And in, and in nature, many you know, plants often, there are multiple compounds of it in the plant that's been used uh, naturally, and the, uh, the so-called entourage effect, and so forth. Um, so, will your work, uh, you know, be, uh, involve the complexity of looking at some of these possibilities, and you know, combinatorially? I mean, that's. I think that's what's exciting about being able to grow these neural networks in tiny wells, right? And by tiny, I mean might take a hundred microliters of volume, but we can manufacture hundreds of these little neural networks or hundreds of these 3D little mini brains. And it's that miniaturization and the ability to extract out information from them that lets us play that game, for example, of looking at all possible pairwise combinations of agents. And if you go through the math and think about maybe a hundred plants and you um, were to look at those in combinations, that's over close to 5,000 different unique combinations then to look at. And as the size of that library grows, if we fractionate it or identify unique components, um, it is in that search space and I'm really excited. And that's this notion of building that network 
rooted under the psychedelics that we understand right now, but looking then for something that can enhance the effect of psilocybin or enhance the effect of that skeletium um, agent then. And I, my gut feeling, and this remains to be seen, but inspired by other work that we've done in the lab, that doing that then can really provide something very beneficial in the long run for this development of new therapeutics. And that's what we mean by next generation um, psychedelics. And if we've done so using humans, patients then, um, as our framework for that information, um, I think it's got a greater chance of impacting uh, patient care. I, I want to also uh, tell the, our uh, participants that um, if you've sent in a question and we don't get to it, we will respond to it after uh, time uh, with, with an email. But there, there are some interesting questions about the idea that, uh, that we're kind of medicalizing uh, the knowledge from these plants. And uh, presumably that would mean that these compounds would be developed through traditional uh, pharmacological testing and approval and so forth. And um, uh, I, I guess the theme of some of these uh, questions is that fair shouldn't people just be able to access, you know, uh, uh, compounds that exist in nature without having to go through the medicalization of them. Um, so, I mean, I realize that's a complicated issue, but maybe you can take it on. Yeah, maybe I think there's sort of two parts to that question that I think is interesting to think about the benefits, though, um, of so-called medicalization, you know, of these. You know, one might be to address the point of access um, to certain agents that may not be present um, throughout the world in all um, sort of contexts then. And that's, I think, harder to, you know, keep in mind when sitting in such an amazing area such as Boston and the rich uh, biomedical um, resources that we have around us. But I think thinking through um, how to provide access to um, agents becomes an important um, benefit then of such an activity. And the second, and I think this is one of the most important, when I think of my own use of medicinal plants and herbs and nutraceuticals then, is to be able to have a better sense of um, what it is that you're actually consuming then from it. I'll give you examples then of trying to access for research purposes then um, components of skeletium that can be purchased off of the web. And unfortunately, in many cases, what you're able to access really isn't the pure plant or pure um, agent. And so when trying to develop medicines that are going to be safe and ultimately effective to patients, um, there are some benefits, I think, of what we're able to do then in standardizing and understanding uh, what it is that you're um, consuming. And I think that has to be balanced, though, with this notion of you know, um, appropriately um, using the information and recognizing the sources of information uh, that we have that come from uh, ultimately indigenous people's knowledge. And so that's a dialogue and something we're excited to take on with um, other leaders in this area that have thought about this, how to do it effectively. And I think there are some great examples to follow. Okay. There was a question about questions uh, that it, uh, about how you get your questions answered through email. If you, if you ask your question anonymously, then, uh, uh, then maybe follow up with a uh, email directly to Molly McCarthy and, she'll be able to uh, uh, have your question answered. Here's a question about uh, 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 a plant called the Syrian rue as a far more accessible and widely available source of harmine and harmaline. Do you have any comments on that? Yeah, Syrian rue is a plant that um, is currently accessible from a variety of different sources. And in fact, was how we first discovered chemically that harmine molecule. Um, that was later recognized to be identical to the compound was called telepathine present in uh, Banisteropsis capi. And it's a great example where multiple different plants produce the same psychoactive component. Then this is a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, which can potentiate the effects then of, for example, dimethyltryptamine. Um, I think it's a great example, though, of um, a plant that may have other components besides the um, harmine within it that are actually, to date, not that well understood. And so when a molecule like that is made, the plant is biosynthesizing it. It's a genetically encoded small molecule, if you will, and may make a variety of other agents that I'd argue today we still don't understand all of them. So even a plant like that, um, which in some sense uh, has been studied and used in society for a long time. Um, I think there's new things um, to learn from it. And that would be a great example um, of one. 
So uh, could our, the work you're doing be relevant to people who are on psychiatric medications? There's a lot of concern, in, even when you mentioned Scaletium, uh, the, the uh, products that contain it will, will caution about use with psychiatric medications. So will, will the work uh, address the potential interaction with drugs that patients with psychiatric disorders may be on? Great point. You know, um, when I think about mental health care, it's something best done um, working with you know, experienced and talented clinicians and physicians that have the experience and knowledge of how to guide such um, activity. So that is because in some cases, then we don't understand the interaction of these natural products with maybe existing medications. Um, and so um, discussing that then um, with the psychiatrist then would be an important um, part of that care. I think though it's we'd like to think of agents that, for example, maybe can um, potentiate uh, the activities of an existing um, therapeutic. And so, um, in part of my life, I've spent a long time thinking about lithium um, as an example used to treat bipolar disorder, but a molecule, or really not a molecule, an ion here. Um, which we don't understand its mechanisms, but could we find a, another plant which potentiates its activity, allowing you then to perhaps lower the dose of lithium that you'd be giving to a patient then, and doing so then reduce the potential um, toxicity that's seen or restore sensitivity to it. And so um, I think if we can conceptualize the challenges of what it is that would have a greater impact um, on patient care, um, the example I think that's so exciting of the potential value of something like um, psilocybin in treatment resistant depression is by definition, it means then often a patient has already not responded to a variety of classical um, pharmaceuticals. And so having impact in those um, challenging and intractable contexts then um, with a potential single dose or limited number of doses combined with psychotherapy, to me, that's the dream of a new kind of psychiatry then um, that changes the model or interact of how um, we provide patient care. And I think that's what's really exciting um, to those in the field then is this perhaps overcomes some of the limitations of our traditional um, psychotherapeutic uh, options. Steve, um, you know, uh, you're an extraordinary teacher, and uh, this has been a really informative program. Uh, one thing I do want to mention, and, and one question uh, raises this issue, I want to point out that Steve's work in the chemical neurobiology lab is one part of the center, and there are uh, other parts that have been the subject of our webinars, the, the neuroimaging, the clinical uh, 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 neuroscience. And for example, uh, uh, an important compound that we are studying in, in other contexts like MDMA is not part of our ethnobotany presentation, but we are obviously um, uh, committed to and interested in the whole field of psychedelics and have um, proposed uh, studies and associated uh, neurobiology and neuroimaging uh, around MDMA research as well. Uh, and we don't mean to say that we're only focused on uh, plant uh, uh, derived uh, potential therapeutics, but really on the whole space of, uh, um, of, of, of psychedelic uh, derived therapeutics. Um, so I, I, I want to make that clear because for those of you joining uh, for the first time may think that we're, we're just about plants. It, we are very committed to the, uh, to, to the, uh, the area that, that Steve, and this is only part of Steve's work as well. This is not all that Steve does for the Center for Neuroscience. Um, and so I know we, we're coming to the end and uh, I wanna just, just, first of all, thank uh, uh, Steve again. Uh, he's an extraordinary colleague and scientist and um, the field of psychedelic uh, neuroscience is uh, um, privileged to have him uh, working on its behalf. Um, you, you know, the, uh, uh, the early work of our center, uh, uh, before the neuroscience of psychedelics can compel traditional funding like federal grant support, uh, will principally be accomplished through private support, including philanthropy. And I want to thank our current donors for partnering with us early on and want others to know that support for activities like Steve just presented will require substantial additional investments from others who are committed to this vision. And if you want to learn more about getting involved in, in our work, feel free to contact Dick Simon or me directly, and we'll be happy to talk about opportunities in this area and how to participate with us. But 
especially thank you very much for uh, attending. Again, a recording of this uh, webinar will be available later in this week and, um, and um, please share it with your, your friends or any who may have missed the live presentation. Um, and, and, and with that, uh, I want to uh, again uh, express my appreciation to all who, who have come together to make this center a reality. Uh, to make it a powerful instrument for the future of this field, for all of those who have been interested in supporting and, and for the team behind us that have made uh, today's program possible. So uh, uh, have a wonderful rest of the week and we look forward to seeing you in November when our next webinar will feature Dr. Sharman Ghaznavi, who is a uh, cognitive neuroscientist and a, a psychiatric clinician who will talk about uh, other studies that we're doing, for example, on treatment-resistant depression, rumination, cognitive neuroscience featuring um, uh, psilocybin and uh, other uh, compounds. And I hope you will join us then. There'll be a save the date uh, notification coming out to all of you on our email list. So uh, thank you all um, again for attending and, uh, and see you again.